Ila Hestatora is back from recess. We are now on resolution number 200-36 LS. Speaker Terlahi, you are recognized. I'd like to make a motion to accept resolution 200-36 LS as substituted on the floor. It's sponsored by myself and Senators Sabina Flores Perez, Jose Pedro Terlahi, Tina Rose Munoz Barnes, Clinton Rigel, Talina Cruz Nelson. Amanda Shelton, Joseph Augustine, Joanne Brown, Teletaitigui, Mary Camacho Torres, B. Anthony Ada, Frank F. Blas Jr., Christopher M. Duenas, and James Moylan. It's a resolution relative to expressing the support of Emina Trente Saiz and Alejas Atur Guahan for the passage of HR 3368, the Lani Kilpatrick Central Pacific Herbicide Relief Act, introduced by the Honorable Michael S. Nicholas in the United States House of Representatives on May 20, 2021 because it seeks to correct injustice, clarify the eligibility of affected veterans, and ex expedite the processing of veteran claims of health conditions caused by Agent Orange exposure in Guam, and advocating for an amendment to H.R. 3368 that reflects the correct dates of Agent Orange use on Guam. I'm introducing the substitute version of Resolution 200 onto the floor because uh, there are necessary additions recommended at the resolution's public hearing that would strengthen the purpose of H.R. 3368. This substituted version and reasons for the substitution were electronically transmitted to the legislative clerk's office, the legal, the legislative council's office, and all senators on Wednesday, November 24, 2021. I'd like to move the substitute version. On the motion to accept Substitute version of resolution number 200-36 LS. Are there any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. Speaker, you're still recognized. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move to place resolution 200-36 LS as substituted on the floor into the third reading file, and I'd like to discuss that motion. Please proceed. So resolution 200 is very similar to the resolution we just entertained except that this is a single purpose resolution, and that is specifically uh, regards to Agent Orange only, and for the, to establish presumptive coverage for veterans who during active military, naval, or air service served on the islands of Guam, Samoa, or the Northern Mariana Islands, or within the harbors and territorial seas of those islands during the period beginning on January 9, 1962, and ending on July 31, 1980, or who served on Johnson Island during the period beginning on January 1, 1972, and ending on September 30, 1977. H.R. 3368 is named after Lonnie Kilpatrick, a Navy veteran who was stationed in Guam in 1971 and 1972. Mr. Kilpatrick worked in electronic warfare during the Vietnam War and recalled living near a jungle area in Guam that was sprayed at night and had turned dead brown by the next morning. Mr. Kilpatrick, who had never been stationed in Vietnam, would later suffer from heart disease, kidney cancer, skin conditions that he believed were connected to herbicide exposure while stationed in Guam. The VA denied Mr. Kilpatrick's 2010 and 2018 Agent Orange service connection claims until a reversal on April 17, 2018, that granted service connected by the VA for, quote, status post-heart transplant, residual of ischemic cardiomyo cardiomyopathy and myocardial infarction, also claimed as ischemic heart disease associated with herbicide exposure, unquote. According to the VA, since the initial claim denial, it had received additional service records confirming Kilpatrick was exposed to Agent Orange while serving in Guam. After several years of struggling with the VA for service connection benefits and an initial VA misdiagnosis of his medical condition, Mr. Kilpatrick was granted service-connected compensation one month before his death on May 5, 2018. There have been previous congressional efforts to get coverage for Guam, uh, for exposure to Agent Orange in previous uh, Congresses. In addition to the Guam Legislature supporting H.R. 3368 through Resolution 236-LS as substitute on the floor, the Guam Legislature also suggests in the resolution an amendment be made 
so that it reflects the correct dates of Agent Orange use in Guam. At the public hearing for this resolution, Attorney John Wells, Chairperson of Military Veterans Advocacy, Inc., informed the Guam Legislature that since H.R. 3368's publication, a credible document had been discovered in UOG's archives that shows the use of Agent Orange in Guam to have taken place earlier than January 9, 1962. The document was published by the U.S. Navy's Materials Testing and Evaluation Division on August 15, 2018, entitled, Guam's Soil Conservation Services Number 3, Herbicides. The document explains herbicide uses in Guam, herbicide application rules and styles, and the review of herbicide action on Guam vegetation. The review of herbicide action on Guam vegetation covers simple inorganic compounds through complex organics, including 2,4-D and 2,4-T. 2,4-5 tri chlorophenoxy acetic acid, the active ingredients in Agent Orange. Therefore, the Guam legislature suggests that all dates in H.R. 3368 stating the use of Agent Orange in Guam to have begun on January 9, 1962 be changed to August 15, 1958 to ensure that no veteran affected by Agent Orange use in Guam be excluded. I'd like to thank my, concerts, my, my, my colleagues for co-sponsoring this piece of legislation. I'd like to thank the Military Veterans Advocacy, Inc., and its, its uh, Commander Je uh, John Wells, Brian Moyer, uh, local resident Susan Olivares and Kenko, Mr. Robert Celestio, who testified at the hearing and who have continued to advocate for many years. All of these people have continued to advocate for the inclusion of Guam under the presumption for exposure to Agent Orange. Their advice and assistance have been instrumental in the efforts I and my office have put forth in regards to Guam's Agent Orange exposure. We've also heard from many of Guam's veterans over several years, even years preceding me, as to their use of herbicides on Guam and their belief that they had been exposed to Agent Orange, as well as residents on Guam who have witnessed and testified that they have witnessed the use of Agent Orange on Guam. So I want to thank the public for submitting testimony to my office and those who were able to present at the public hearing to tell us their stories and provide basis to these uh, stories and for Congress to know uh, the impact of Agent Orange on Guam. So again, I ask my colleagues to help me to move this and to get our testimony in front of Congress while they uh, consider these bills. Madam Speaker, Sujo Smasi. Sujo Smasi, Madam Speaker. On substitute version of resolution number 200-36. Senator Perrys, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in full support of this resolution. I think it's so important that Guam is finally recognized uh, on, the, on the national level that Agent Orange was used here. And it's through the persistent work of, of um, Speaker Chalahi and uh, many of the veterans that came to our aid uh, to, to direct um, Guam EPA on where to test, uh, where to find Agent Orange. And um, through their guidance, they were able to find the areas and um, it turned up positive. And just, you know, knowing that this has taken place uh, decades, decades ago, you know, the, um, you know, it's the potential to, to um, find it is, it becomes more difficult. So through, it's through their efforts uh, that we are able to be recognized. And so this is so important. Um, I think what's also important to note is that with the uh, HR, 3368, um, with its passage, um, it would allow for presumptive coverage again for those that were here on Guam from August 15, 1958 to July 31st, 1980. And if they experience any of these ailments, uh, which include chloracne or other acniform diseases, type two diabetes, Hodgkin's disease, multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, acute and subacute peripheral neuropathy, porphyria cutanea tarda, prostate cancer, respiratory cancers, which include the lung, the bronchus, larynx, or trachea, 
and soft tissue sarcomas other than osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, Kaposi's sarcoma, and mesothelioma. So again, you know, it's, it's sad to see that Lo Loni Kilpatrick, you know, he was unable to see the fruits of his labor. You know, he was, uh, you know, spraying Agent Orange and he wasn't able to avail himself of the much needed medical relief. But through his, his efforts and many of the efforts of our veterans, um, it, it facilitates healthcare uh, for those that uh, were in the front lines. So the, again, I rise in full support. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Perez. On resolution number 200-36, as substituted on the floor. Speaker Terlahi may close. Sidus Maasi, and I'd like to again thank my colleagues and just uh, simply close by uh, moving again to place resolution 200-36 LS as substituted on the floor into the third reading file. On the motion to place resolution number 200-36 LS as substituted on the floor into the third reading voting file. Are there any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. We're now back on, we are now on resolution number 210. I recognize Senator Perez. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I move to place resolution 210-36 COR, um, introduced by myself, Senator Sabina Flores Perez, Senator Teresa M. Terlahi, Talo T. Taitigui, and Joanne Brown. It's relative to reaffirming reaffirm Guam's right to safeguard cultural resources and to protect ocean ecosystems from environmental harm and exploitive industry interests through a moratorium on seabed mining to ensure the health of Guam's people. And I wish to place this in the third reading file and I wish to discuss. Please proceed. Res Resolution 21036 was created to raise awareness of large scale impacts of deep seabed mining to our oceans that have sustained and nurtured our people and culture throughout centuries. As oceanic people, it is part of our shared responsibility to protect this precious and sacred resource. Resolution 210 is a call to action for the international community to support the common goal of protecting our oceans because the threat of deep sea mining is imminent with a push to fast track regulations that would open the door to granting commercial licenses as soon as 2023. The passage of this resolution is of utmost priority and urgency because the International Seabed Authority the governing body of the open seas under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea convenes December 6 to potentially decide on opening a Pandora's box of environmental impacts, which may include the following, species extinction and loss of biodiversity, sediment plumes and tailings with the potential to pollute the entire water column, the uptake of heavy metals and toxins by marine animals, including commercial fisheries, the disturbance of marine mammals from constant noise and light in the water, the risk of oil spills and accidents from increased vessel and surface traffic, the destruction of coral reefs through increased acidity of the water, the potential for induced seismic activity and increased carbon emissions. Our ocean stores 50 times as much carbon dioxide as the atmosphere. It is foreseeable that the increased level of activity and disturbance can impair the ability of our oceans to store carbon dioxide, thus exacerbating global climate change and potentially counteracting the current international efforts to stem any further increase in surface temperatures. Exploratory mining has already impacted Pacific Island nations. In the case of Tonga, the existing deep sea mining exploration licenses cover traditional fishing grounds and have already disturbed both commercial and local fishing operations simply from the effects of increased numbers of large vessels in the water. And these vessels have reportedly changed fish patterns, 
forcing fishermen to make large detours to find new fishing grounds, creating additional burdens on an already stressed industry. In Papua New Guinea, islanders in New Ireland and East New Britain have already experienced negative impacts from exploratory mining and drilling occurring 30 to 50 kilometers from their communities, including reported effects of shark calling and on other fisheries and cultural customs with the resultant impacts on tourism. Additionally, the Papua New, New Guinea government is not only unlikely to profit from the corporation that was granted the exploratory license, but the government has now taken out a loan which increases substantial debt in order to pay for 15% equity in the project. Deep sea mining, which is driven by increased demand of metals used in technological products, could be averted by increased investment in circular economy to include better design of products to facilitate recycling and reuse. Large corporations such as Google, Samsung, BMW, Volvo have pledged to, sus to sustain, a source their materials sustainably. Resolution 210 calls for a moratorium on deep sea mining by the International Seabed Authority unless and until the following. Rigorous and transparent impact statements have been conducted, which includes environmental, social, cultural, and environmental risks of deep seabed mining. Uh, the precautionary principle, it's an ecosystem approach where the polluter pays uh, have been implemented in which policies to ensure the responsible production and use of materials, such as the reduction in the demand of primary metals, the transformation to resource efficient circular economy, and responsible terrestrial mining practices. For public consultation mechanisms to be incorporated into all decision-making processes related to deep sea mining, ensuring effective engagement, allowing for independent review, and where relevant that free, prior and informed consent of indigenous people is respected and consent from potentially affected communities is achieved. And finally, to promote the reform of the International, International Seabed Authority to ensure transparent, accountable, inclusive, effective, and environmentally responsible decision making. I thank my colleagues and I um, appreciate any, uh, their support in this very important measure. Sutos Moss. Sidhu Smasi, Senator, on Resolution 210, is there anyone who would like to be recognized? Senator Taitagui, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I stand in full support of this resolution, and I thank the author for doing her due diligence to, to look into this um, with regards to um, the protection of our, our waters, and, and definitely when it comes to any kind of mining. I remember during the public hearing, I mentioned uh, same circumstances when there was a, um, like a memorial uh, in the northern part of the Northern Marianas, uh, that they were putting this as some kind of memorial like uh, park and it would stay that no fisheries can, no fishermen can go in that area and it was abundant of fish. And only to come find out that the real reason was because of the minerals that are below the ocean in that area that was so, how you say, uh, very rich. And we're finding out certain areas in the Pacific Ocean, certain countries are even doing, you know, trying to uh, actually, you know, claim certain parts of the ocean because of these rich, rich uh, minerals down below. But I thought one of the testimonies um, that was provided during this uh, public hearing, and I just wanted to, to just read just a few inserts from here because it, it definitely explains, you know, the importance of why we were trying to protect from deep sea mining and the importance of it. There's a section where it says, when the first humans, Swiss oceanographer Jacques Picard and U.S. Navy Lieutenant Don Walsh landed on the bottom of the Marianas Trench in 1960, they saw a fish. That significance of that sighting was that it provided evidence that life exists at those extreme depths but more sufficiently they, that enough oxygen gas was available to support fish 
in the deep sea. Years later, the mechanism by which ox oxygen is delivered was discovered to be ocean currents that run both cold and deep and warm and shallow throughout all Earth's ocean basins. These are thermal Holland currents sink to great depths by being cold and dense in areas called downwellings. And as the currents mix with warmer water, they rise to the surface in areas called updwellings and run warm and shallow. So basically what you're saying is that the, these currents circulate around the globe, a globe and are responsible for delivering oxygen to the deep, carrying nutrients to the surface to support plankton and upper to topic levels and re regulating global temperatures. When we were at the public hearing and listening to this testimony, you know, it really gives you that sense of this one particular fish that was discovered to show that there was life down below. And I think that was enough right then and there to, for us to realize that that's an area that needs protecting as well and the importance of these oxygens coming up to the surface. I'm sure there's more on a scientific level to explain in other terms the importance of this, but just keep thinking to yourself, it's as simple as this. There is life at that, those depths. There is life. So let's do the right thing and protect it, and especially it's in our backyard. So it's very important that we stand all in support of this resolution as it goes to Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Is there any other Senator who would like to be recognized in Resolution 210? If not, then the sponsor may close on the resolution. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to the retiring speaker for um, bringing to light, you know, the unique ecosystem that is at the deep sea floor. And I think, too, what's so important is that we don't know so much um, about the deep sea and how it could potentially impact uh, global climate change, not just about, you know, our oceans holding a, a lot of carbon dioxide, but, um, you know, everything's interconnected, right? So what we do to one portion of, of, an ocean, of a part of, of our oceans can af ultimately affect other parts of the world. And there's so much that needs to be done as far as, um, you know, regulations and protections. You know, how do we know, you know, and as far as monitoring, you know, that's one of the, the, the difficulties is how is, who's going to monitor? Who's going to monitor the effects? You know, what are the effects and who's going to monitor these effects? I think the fact that we are going so deep to the ocean floor is, you know, already a sign that we've gone too far in trying to obtain resources. Uh, we, we're definitely living beyond our means, our environmental means. And we need to, you know, really take a close look before we really undermine our own ecosystems that supports us. You know, we really, to, we really need to make, take steps to prevent any further damage. And, you know, Pacific Islanders are in the front lines of global climate change. And with this potential opening up of, of commercial licenses, we will be in the front lines of deep sea mining. And we haven't even addressed climate change uh, enough to really prevent any further harms from happening. And so it's so important to have voices from the Pacific. You know, we, we know this is, this is our resource, this is sacred to us. You know, it's important that we register uh, Pacific voices into the policies that are going to affect not only us, but the world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. On the motion to place Resolution 210 on the third reading file, is there any objection? Hearing and seeing no objection, motion carries. We're now on Resolution 203. Primary sponsor is not present. And Senator Camacho Torres, you are recognized. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to place resolution number 203 36LS as amended by the author, introduced by Tina Rose Munya Barnes, Mary Camacho Torres, Talina Cruz Nelson, Teresa M. Terlahi, Amanda L. Shelton, Joe S. San Augustin, Jose Pito Terlahi, James C. Moylan, and V. Anthony Ada into the third reading file. This is relative to expressing the support of Imena Trentai Saiz na Legislature in Guahan, the 36th Guam Legislature, for the passage of the Build Back Better framework, which would provide needed investments in the community of Guam, including parity for U.S. citizens residing in the territories through supplemental security income inclusion and expansion of Medicaid. And I wish to speak on the measure for further, Madam Speaker. All right, just to clarify, so this is resolution 203-36 LS as amended by the author. Correct. All right, on that motion, uh, please proceed. Thank you. Resolution 203-36 expresses, and Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm delivering this message on behalf of Vice Speaker Munya Barnes, so these are her words. I'm just uh, speaking on her behalf. Resolution 203-36 expresses the Guam Legislature's endorsement of the Build Back Better Act, which would provide needed investments in the community of Guam, including parity for U.S. citizens residing in the territories through supplemental security income inclusion and expansion of Medicaid. President Biden's Build Back Better Act proposes a once-in-a-lifetime investment for Guam, our sister ter U.S. territories, and states in our union. If passed by the U.S. Congress, this act will create new jobs, increase wages, spur long-term economic growth, and reduce the cost of living for our people. The Build Back Better Act also brings the territories one step closer to parity. The Biden Build Back Better Framework will extend SS benefits to Guam and increase Medicaid funding for Guam. Over the last few months, I, have, I and several of our colleagues have advocated congressional leadership in the Biden administration for parity towards the American territories. Earlier this year, I testified in front of a House committee regarding this injustice and advocated for Congress to exercise its plenary powers and end the separate but equal treatment of Americans living in the territories. Senator Torres and several members of Ile Legislature in Guahan have sent countless letters to Chairman Grijalva, Vice Chair Khalili Sablan, and congressional leadership. We engaged with the White House. We reminded them that they did not have to wait for the courts to finally address the injustices of the past. It had the power to do so right now. My colleagues, Congress has finally heeded to our call. For months, members of the Guam Legislature, our governor, our delegate to Congress, and leaders from all the territories have urged congressional leadership and the Biden administration to ex extend access to much needed social services to the territories and end this unequal treatment. With a united voice, we are able to tell our story and I ask my colleagues for their support now on Resolution 203-36. Sidus Maasi. Sidus Maasi. Is there any other senator who'd like to be recognized on Resolution 203 as amended by the author? If not, then sponsor may close. Senator Torres, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to um, mention that the only change to this was the addition of uh, other members of the leadership of the Senate and the House uh, to receive copies. But essentially, the resolution remained as is. And I thank my colleagues for their favorable consideration and uh, hope that this will bring closure to many marginalized citizens that have not felt the parity as a result of being residents of Guam. So thank you everyone for your consideration and uh, 
Thank you also to the main sponsor, uh, Vice Speaker Tina Rose Munya Barnes, for the foresight and the, the vigilance in seeing many of these issues through uh, and having Guam's voice heard uh, with our congressional leaders. Thank you. This is Mossy, Senator. On the motion to place resolution number 203 36LS as amended by the author in the third reading file. Is there any objection? Hearing and seeing no objection, motion carries. We're now on resolution number 153. Senator Nelson, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to place resolution number 153-36 into the third reading call and to discuss. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resolution number 153-36 was co-sponsored by myself, Senator Paris, Senator Barnes, Vice Speaker, Senator Moylan, Senator Ada, the Speaker, Therese Terlahi, Mary Camacho Torres, uh, the Legislative Secretary, Amanda Shelton, and Jose Pito Terlahi. Resolution number 153-36 is relative to expressing the utmost support of Imanai Trentai Sai Snellisator and Guahan and advocating for the passage of H.R. 928, which is also known as the American Family Act of 2021, introduced by Delegate Rosa DeLaro of Connecticut Representative which seeks to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to make the child tax credit fully refundable, establish and increase child tax credit for young children and for other purposes. And Madam Speaker, we saw um, with just, just, this, just this past budget session that, uh, that Guam was able to receive a $93.5 million reimbursement in child tax credit. Um, and for many years, this has been an unfunded mandate. And so now we see that, um, that Congress is starting to realize that it is important for uh, equity, especially within the territories. And so I ask my colleagues for their support. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Is there anyone who'd like to be recognized on resolution number 153-36LS? Senator Perez, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in full support of this resolution. I think it's important that um, it's codified in, in national law that um, you know, Guam will be included in this uh, reimbursement. And not only that, there is an increase uh, to the amount that will be given to uh, dependents uh, from $2,000 to $3,000 over the age of six and from $2,000 to $3,600 um, for those under the age of six and it extends the limit from 16 to 17 years of age. So I think, um, you know, this is really critical, you know, for Guam, uh, a lot of our people, you know, 23% of our population is uh, below the poverty level, and that's according to federal standards. Um, you know, our cost of living is so much higher here. So this definitely uh, is very, uh, will support many of our families. This is Masi. Just Mossy Senator, is there anyone else who'd like to be recognized on Resolution 153-36? Legislative Secretary Shelton, you're recognized. This is just Mossy, Madam Speaker, and I rise in support of Resolution Number 153-36. Uh, this, the American Families Act of 2021, it seeks to expand the child tax credit and permanize the advance payments, providing a direct benefit to lower and middle class income families during this period of economic anxiety. And Guam families have already seen uh, the boom of these payments provide as the first payments arrived earlier, a few months ago, earlier this year. I read a study recently that was published by the Washington State University where it said that parents receiving extra money spent it on their kids 90% of the time. This extra money in the pockets will go towards providing essentials for families like food, clothing, education. This is the extra leg up that will help families thrive and provide children with what they need to succeed. Really proud of this uh, administration for directly investing in families through the child tax credit, through the American Rescue Plan. And I think we're gonna see further expansion through the Build Back Better Act to strengthen families, to build up the foundation of our community, 
And this expansion of the child tax credit advance payments uh, made permanent through the American Families Act of 2021 uh, is going to do just that. So I wanna thank the sponsor of this uh, resolution uh, for, uh, for expressing our support of the legislature um, to, to make this a reality for our families here on Guam. Sidhu Asmasi. Sidhu Asmasi. Is there any other senator who would like to be recognized on resolution number 153 36LS? If not, then the sponsor may close. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resolution 153-36 moves to do several things. It increases the maximum child tax credit and pay benefits monthly for all children under 17. It will expand the CTC to 250 per month to $3,000 per year for children six years of age or older and $300 per month, which is 3,600 per year for children, for children under six, up from the current maximum 2,000 per year. And, and the most, the beautiful thing about this, Madam Speaker, is we're starting to show that we're investing in our families. Um, and, and that is paramount, especially in a community in, in Guam where families are very important to us. Uh, another thing that the child tax credit will do, uh, the resolution will do, is make credit fully refundable. The bill would make the CTC fully refundable, meaning that all low-income families would receive the full credit for each child. The current CTC only begins to phase in after a taxpayer has earned $2,500 of income and at a rate of 15 cents every dollar of additional income. In addition, $1,400 of the $2,000 credit is refundable. It will also benefit the middle class. This bill will provide a tax credit for all, children, for all individuals with children who earn less than $150,000 per year and all married couples with children who earn less than $200,000 per year. So it also increases the income gap. Um, and as we see, as uh, we move towards uh, recovery from the pandemic, we see that prices are increasing. And so now we're acknowledging the hard work that these families have done, and we're starting to acknowledge the middle class uh, community. It will also increase the credit for inflation, and the bill would index the credit to inflation rounding to the nearest $50 to preserve the value of the credit going forward and the current CTC is not indexed for inflation. And so that's a good thing. Also, Madam Speaker, uh, just to be aware that uh, we understand that the Build Back Better framework provides child tax credit, but that's only until 2023. So this way we are looking to advocate to continue this reimbursement, this unfunded mandate for starting today, moving forward indefinitely. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to move Bill number one, resolution number 153-36 into the third reading file for voting. On that motion to place resolution 153-36 LS into the third reading file, is there any objection? Hearing and seeing no objection, motion carries. concluded the resolutions, and we are now proceeding with the bills, beginning with bill number 73-36 COR. Senator Atta, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to make a motion to move bill 73-36 COR, introduced by myself, Frank F. Bloss Jr., Christopher M. Duenas, James C. Moylan. And it's an act to amend Section 60102 and 60103 of Chapter 10, Title 10, Guam Code Annotated, relative to removing the restrictions of ownership on ownership of suppressors and silencers from Guam law by enacting the Hearing Protection Act of 2021 to the third reading. And I'd like to speak on the motion, please. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Hearing Protection Act is exactly what it is, to protect the hearing of those who train with firearms. Silencers or suppressors have one purpose, and that's to make training with firearms safer. For my, for my colleagues who are unfamiliar with uh, suppressors or silencers, a typical silencer is metallic. It's usually made of stainless steel, 
or titanium, and it contains internal baffles that, and a hollow bore that when attached to the firearm, when the firearm is discharged, it allows that, that expanded gases that goes through to cool and slow as it, dis, as it uh, exit the, the suppressor, thereby bringing the, the noise of the, the firearm to a reduced, uh, reduced uh, noise. National organizations such as the Academy of Doctors of Audiology and National Hearing Conservation Association and the National Hearing Conservation Organizations have all stated that suppressors reduce the sound of gunfire by 15 to 30 decibels. And it does not sound like much, but when you constantly are out there training with your firearm, every decibel counts. Because of the fact that, you know, when, when you're constantly out there in the firing range, even if you're wearing uh, hearing protection, a reduced gunfire helps protect your hearing. And that's what this bill is about. It continues to allow our people who abide by the law to be able to protect themselves by protecting their hearing with the use of silencers. Unfortunately, there have been many myths and untruths about silencers and suppressors that suppressors make guns silent. And that's the furthest from the truth. Uh, you can still hear the gunfire when it's, uh, you can still hear the, the sound of the gunfire when, when the weapon is discharged. And it does not make it silent to where you, you can't hear it. It also said, there's other uh, uh, untruths that suppressors enable criminals. And that is also absolutely not true. Based on reports from the U.S. De Justice Department from 2011 to 2019, there are 1.3 million suppressors in circulation in the United States, with only 16 instances of criminal use since 2011. Suppressors make it practically impossible to conceal, conceal a handgun, and it takes time to attach and detach from the firearm. And keep in mind that once you fire, once you discharge your firearm, that suppressor is just as hot on your first round to your fifth round. So it does not make it uh, any easier or safer to uh, detach your suppressor right after firing. And to purchase a suppressor, you have to be a resident of the state where suppressors are legal. You have to be at least 21 years of age. You have to be a United States resident, be legally allowed to purchase a firearm. You have to pass an ATF background check that usually takes about six to eight months. In addition, you have to fill out an ATF Form 4 in duplicate. You have to fill out an FBI Form FD-258. You have to submit a $200 check to the, Bureau of Alcohol, the, to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives for the uh, National Firearms Act. You have to submit passport photos. So, Madam Speaker, this is not a, just a once-and-done issue. There are, there are protocols in place that, vent, that vets a, a potential owner of a, supp a suppressor thoroughly before they can even be allowed to purchase one. You know, we were up at the, the shooting range the other day, and I was asking the owner of the shooting range, how has it been up here? And he goes, you know, Senator, what's important is that we're getting more people here to train how to use their firearms. We're getting people here to want to be safe in learning how to use their firearms. Have you seen lately, have you seen lately in the media that we've been having sports competition with firearms? 
precision shooting, target shooting. So this has been something that is not just out and about. There's people that are taking active steps into ensuring that our public, that our community is learning how to use their firearms safely and that when they do so, that everything is kept in mind for them. So Madam Speaker, I ask that my colleagues please consider supporting Bill 7336 and I hope to get um, enough votes to let this pass and let's continue to keep our community safe and the bottom line is, let's let our law-abiding citizens be able to continue to avail themselves of uh, these types of uh, bills and, and laws that are there for them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Is there anyone who'd like to be recognized on bill number 73-36COR? Senator Brown, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to ask the sponsor a question. I mean, you know, with all the, the challenges we're currently dealing with in our community with regards to crimes that are happening almost on a daily basis, and, and as he mentioned, of course, people have a perception by watching TV and the movies of, of uh, you know, that silencers are used for these type of crimes. Uh, I just wanted to ask him, who are the primary users of these silencers and how, I know you briefly commented in his introduction of the bill, but how do you give the people some sense of comfort that this is not intended to, to increase the crime rate on Guam and that, you know, silencers are primarily used by law-abiding citizens that actually may be uh, either for sport, uh, you know, who, who go to gun ranges and practice, uh, also those in law enforcement also that I know uh, in order to maintain uh, their, their licensing and capabilities have to go out and have so many, so many hours of, um, you know, training with regards to and, and certainly use of firearms. So I just wanted to ask that because I think that's probably the main question a lot of people have in their minds with regards to this whole silencer issue. If he would yield, Madam Speaker, to that question. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker. Senator Ada, would you yield to the yes. question? Uh, currently, law enforcement uses um, these things in tactical uh, usage for, for their, um, their officers. And when you look at what a suppressor does uh, for law enforcement, it actually allows them to have command and control of their, of their team. When you hear a loud bang, what happens is that that first initial bang rings your ears if you're not uh, wearing hearing protection. And when you're in law enforcement, I'm sure that when, when they fire their, their, when they discharge their weapons without a suppressor, that first ring throughout the year, in the years, can actually prevent them from hearing what other further command and, uh, and, uh, that their troops may have. But further from that, uh, Senator, that the, the, when you look at what we currently have, I mean, these are things that we want to ensure that our people can use and be proficient in their firearms. And suppressors can help first time users of firearms to go down range, shoot at their targets, and be able to not worry about whether they're, they're gonna have their hearing the next day. But all these, all suppressors is, is just a, another layer of safety for a person, the individual's hearing. Um, and that's all it is. I mean, that, that's, that's all it is. And I hope it answers your question, Senator. Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I appreciate uh, Senator Ada responding to those questions because I, I think those are probably questions a lot of people have in their mind with regards to this bill. With that, Madam Speaker, I have no further questions with regards to, to Bill 73-36. Uh, Thank you, Senators. Uh, on the bill, Senator Taitigui, you're recognized, and then Senator Duenas. Sijus Masi, Madam Speaker. You know, Madam Speaker, when it, when it comes to guns, I guess women are probably the most, you know, intimidated by it because, you know, the violence that surrounds guns. 
So I made it a point to be one of those who attended um, the demonstration on Saturday at the shooting range. And I'd like to thank the staff there that was very nice, very kind to us and, and very thorough, most especially very safe. They were very, make sure that we all were wearing closed shoes, that, um, you know, that we, we had the right uh, clothing on. And, and I really appreciate the uh, Department of uh, GPD who is there, provided the, provided us the sample of the sound, the difference between a gun being shot with a suppressor on and one without a suppressor on. And then we actually, Madam Speaker, had an opportunity to shoot the gun as well. I mean, to really get a, a good feel of it. I've one that's been always you know, intimidated by guns. You know, I didn't like it. I mean, the closest I've ever got is when you go to a, you know, carnival and they have those guns or the penny arcade when you're shooting those. It's, it's a little bit different than really having something that can hurt somebody. But when I was there, Madam Speaker, I found that there were many, there were other women there actually that were practicing. And in fact, I think one of the ladies there who was in, I believe she might be an instructor, because she sure knew how to hold her gun and you know, felt comfortable around it. And I'm seeing that more women now are getting involved. That's what we were told. There, more women are coming down to the shooting range to practice to learn how to use this gun. So I also videotaped, had it videotaped of shooting the gun with the suppressor on and one without. There wasn't that Hollywood type of Thing that I was anticipating with a suppressor. You know, I was expecting to be so silent that you don't, it, you know, a whisper, just like you, you see on, in movies or on TV. And it wasn't that, Madam Speaker. The sound was not of a whisper. The sound was still loud enough that it could be heard that, um, almost as clear as Without, without a suppressor. And then from when I had the opportunity to, to shoot the gun, I found that with, without the suppressor, it kicked and it also startled me, just the sound, and my ear was ringing. Then when I tried it with the suppressor, it didn't have that high pitch sound um, but, and it also didn't kick back, which allowed me to concentrate on the target I was shooting at. So it was actually more comfortable. But then I thought, all these people working there at this shooting gallery, helping other people to learn to be safe with their firearms and, and be upstanding citizens and know how to use it and be registered. Um, I can't imagine having to hear that, you know, sound all, all the time when they're shooting. It's just, even with the earmuffs on, I had the earmuffs on, we tested that too as well. But it wasn't that movie Hollywood sound that everybody was anticipating. But what it was, was something more tolerable. And when you look at all these public safety officers who have to train without that and how their hearing can go bad, I think there was a, a bill on this floor that has something to do with allowing police officers, you know, retiring earlier because of the wear and tear on their body. Well, I bet you it's wear and tear on their ears as well. I've been a musician for 20 years and I stand behind a drummer and now I have problems with hearing. But that's nothing compared to having to shoot a gun. And then there's gonna be a time where these police officers would have to practice where they can't wear these um, safety headphones on when they're in like a battle situation. And that also pertains to military as well. So now we have an opportunity at this legislature to allow this type of suppressor to be used to save the hearing of our police officers who put their lives 
on je in jeopardy for our safety. And every police officer I've spoken to is in favor, in favor of this legislation. The ones I spoke, especially those who are at the shooting range, this is very helpful for them. But Madam Speaker, like I said, though, something that was very important when I did the demonstration with the gun was that with the suppressor on, I, I wasn't startled, I wasn't scared, because once you pull that trigger and you're startled, it, it really it throws you off versus something that is not so loud that scares you or piercing that you stay concentrated and focused. So I did my due diligence and came, went there uh, on Saturday to get uh, to be able to observe firsthand. So now I, I'm here supporting this legislation because I know the importance of it, especially those are public safety officers who've asked for this legislation. And most especially, Madam Speaker, what happens when those non-law-abiding individuals who go behind a car of someone's trunk, you know, that there are no regulations or rules, and they're actually utilizing certain mechanisms like homemade suppressors that are very dangerous, very dangerous. But here we are with individuals who want to be law-abiding individuals, who want to follow the laws, who put care on how they place their guns or store it away or how they use it. And these are the peop same people who are asking for our help. So I stand in full support of this legislation, Madam Speaker, because of those reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Duane, you're recognized. Sidhu Smasi, Madam Speaker. Um, as a prime uh, co-sponsor to the bill, obviously I rise in support of Bill 7336. I wanted to make a couple of observations. Uh, the question was asked earlier in terms of the potential intent and the potential you know, uh, security and safety to the public. I'm, I'm very thankful that Guam has very strict gun laws and firearms ID requirements and the obtaining a firearm on Guam actually I think is a model for many other jurisdictions. If you read in the legislative intent, one of the eight enumerated uh, um, uh, uh, sections there in terms of uh, you know, requirements must be registered, must be able to register and license a firearm. In other words, you must be licensed. This is not um, an item that would be sitting on the shelf for anyone to just walk in and pick up and say, I want to build my, buy my suppressor today. It would basically be the same thing as buying a firearm. Um, I think it was mentioned as well earlier, if, if, if even, even if you go into the committee report, uh, by and large, the individuals who showed up to testify, and I was there during the public hearing, were those individuals that for almost their entire lifetime as part of their job and as part of their duties, have had to be proficient. Uh, law enforcement officers, of course, members of the military, um, and even when they, they're out, a lot of them still have careers and jobs that are associated with public safety where the proficiency of a firearm is, is, is basically <laughs> life and death for them. And so to have to, uh, to be able to do something to allow a legal implement to be attached to a firearm so that they could minimize damage to their hearing, I think it's just something that's prudent for us to do. I think it was mentioned in the public hearing and it's something that's been mentioned you know, widely whenever we talk about firearms. You know, an individual who is a law-abiding citizen doesn't 
operate a sawed-off shotgun. An individual who is a law-abiding citizen, you know, doesn't scratch a serial number off a firearm or possess one. An individual who is not a law-abiding citizen will do anything and whatever it takes to possess any type of weapon to do damage, kill, maim in the commission of crimes, felonies, and the like. So I just thought it was important to say this is really um, something that augments what already exists in law on Guam. It is designed to assist in the protection of individuals, law-abiding citizens, who either for reasons of um, pure, uh, maybe recreation, hunters who also would practice for efficiency, or maybe just individuals who are so inclined for self-protection that they do go to the range from time to time and have an opportunity to use you know, an item that would be legally obtained with the same restrictions and requirements as would be required to obtain a firearm legally and to possess. So, Madam Speaker, with that, I, I certainly hope, and I, and I would understand, of course, that we should always act with prudence when we're looking at something that is, could be perceived in the public or could be perceived by others as having uh, maybe some sort of advantage towards a criminal or the, the ability to, to commit a crime and conceal some of that, um, you know, that ability to, to be caught, captured, or otherwise identified. I just don't see the reality in that with regard to this uh, particular device. And I just see that we clearly have, um, you know, the protections uh, when being sold uh, to law-abiding citizens who otherwise be able to uh, obtain firearms. In closing, I have a close relative of mine that I spend a lot of time with. Of course, he's not a member of the military, didn't go to war. It's, it wasn't uh, his day-to-day -day job for proficiency at firearms. But he has another job where earlier in his career, he was, he's consistently around, you know, loud machinery. And I tell you, if you know any individual who really suffers from hearing loss based on having to be around loud noises uh, as part of their profession, you really will kind of see um, how debilitating it is in your older age uh, with something that uh, a career associated, um, you know, a relationship that causes loss of hearing, it really lowers quality of life quite a bit. Uh, so I wanted to enter in that it is people's profession uh, to be extremely proficient. I know I mentioned that earlier, but I just, because it's a personal experience. So I think anything that we can do to help individuals who, like I said, it, it is uh, a part of their duty uh, to have additional layer of protection, we should. And I think it's a prudent thing to do. So I hope our colleagues will see the wisdom in uh, supporting this legislation. Sujus Masi, Madam Speaker. Sujus Masi, Senator. Is there anyone else who'd like to be recognized on bill number 73-36, COR? Senator Torres, you are recognized. Madam Speaker, many of the, um, the compelling reasons why bill 73-36 is a, a good bill for consideration were expressed by the, the previous speaker. But I, I also wanna just add from a practical point that there, the, the one point that many of us um, should emphasize is that the ability to procure a silencer is almost as rigorous as it is to get a gun license, and, and that you, you, the application process has to be there in order for you to get one. And also a gun license ownership, uh, a license to own a gun is also rigorous in and of itself. So. The safety measures in terms of, of gun ownership and ownership of a suppressor are, are pretty much parallel. So that should alleviate some of the concern about people getting their hands on these. But also from a practical point of view, you know, I, I do know firsthand some family members who were affected by gunshot uh, noise 
that took uh, their that impacted their hearing adversely, and so it, it's a very it's a very real situation. And I think that um, this bill addresses what many in the community view as a concern, a practical concern for them, where they are lawful gun owners or ga or, or gun handlers um, by profession. The need to minimize that danger to their hearing, which is, you know, one of the, the most critical senses that we have um, is necessary. And so I, I rise in support. I just wanted to, uh, you know, commend the, some of the previous speakers for bringing up those points, which oftentimes are, we're concerned about the safety, but there are really very practical reasons why you would want to also consider the safeguards for the lawful uh, gun user, uh, user and handler. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Is there, is there any other Senator who'd like to be recognized on bill number 73-36-LF? I mean, COR. Senator Nelson, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, a question for the, for the author of the bill. Please state your question. Is there any law prohibiting our law enforcement in utilizing these firearm suppressors. Would the author of the bill yield to the question? If I heard the question correctly, is there any law that prohibits our law enforcement officers from utilizing a suppressor? Not that I've seen in, in the uh, GCA. Are the law enforcement officers authorized to utilize firearm suppressors? Would the sponsor yield to that question? Senator Ada, would you, would you yield? I, yeah, yes, Madam Speaker, but I, I'm not sure of that, uh, that uh, what the answer to that would be. Um, if there's any exemptions for law enforcement or military that gives them the, the authority to use uh, suppressors, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that at this time. Okay. What is the current statute that allows you that gives you the distance of where you can discharge your firearm. Would the sponsor yield to that question? I, I didn't get the, the question. I could barely hear it. At the... What is the distance or the um, environment required in statute for you to discharge your firearm? I believe in, in discharging a firearm that you, you're not allowed to discharge firearms in residential areas. So, um, what the distance is, I'm, I'm familiar with. Can I get a, and also, Madam Speaker, my one last question is, um, what is the current fee for firearm licensing and how would we apply that for firearm suppression, for firearm suppressors? So I believe for a firearm Did the sponsor suppressor, yield to that yeah, question? Yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, in, the, in the committee report, you would see that Guam Police Department had uh, submitted a, um, a testimony uh, looking at uh, implementing fees for, the, for suppressors. Uh, unfortunately, that, that testimony came in after the public hearing, and there weren't individuals that were able to testify whether they should be able to uh, have Fees. An individual did bring up the, the idea of implementing fees, but that's all that was uh, discussed about. And later on, if there's any legislation that would be to require fees for registering uh, suppressors, I, I don't think that there should be any problem with that. But I think that it should be a separate legislation just so that we can get the input of the public. So, Madam Speaker, just on that, when uh, we do not know if law enforcement, auth the author stated that we are not aware of anything prohibiting law enforcement officers to utilize firearm suppressors. Uh, I heard one of the concerns is that the law enforcement officers need to utilize this type of modification on the weapon for their own safety. Um, however, that cannot be validated if they currently use the firearm, su firearm suppressor at this time. Uh, the second one was the distance on where you can discharge your firearm. 
and also that is not very clear at this time. And Madam Speaker, we've seen a lot of incidences at, um, happening in our nation and also uh, just one of videos going viral where people are pulling out their weapons or their firearms in the middle of, of the community and pointing it at, other, at others, at other residents within a residential area that you're not allowed to do in accordance with the law. And so I, I support the Second Amendment, I support the right to bear arms, but we need to do a better job at making proper safety measures before we move forward with this type of legislation. If someone, who, if someone has the will to pull out a firearm in a residential zone, pointing their firearm at other individuals within the residential area, then we have an issue here. And supporting a bill that authorizes firearm suppressors, that I get it, you, you don't, um, the firearm suppressor does not eliminate the sound, it creates a 30 decibel uh, resonance, but I get it. But if you're really truly out there for the sport and out of the, for the passion, you don't need a firearm suppressor, you just put on earplugs. And there's this rhetoric back and forth nationally about this, but I think right now we need to focus on our community is why are people pulling out their guns in residential areas and how do we protect them first before moving forward with this type of legislation? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Is there anyone else who'd like to be recognized on Bill 73-36? Do you have a point of order, Senator? Uh, just to put information, Madam Speaker, if I may, I, I forgot to you know, offer anyone here who would like to see the video. I have a copy of it if, uh, on that day on Saturday who missed it. There was only like three of us that showed up. So if there's any senators who'd like to listen to this, I'd be happy to share it with them. Just a point of order, point of personal privilege, Madam Speaker. I know how to fire a weapon and I know what a firearm suppressor does. Is there anyone else who'd like to be recognized on bill number 73? Sen Legislative Secretary. Speaker Chilahi, you are recognized. This, there's been a lot of talk about um, in our public hearing and in calls to my office in regards to this bill. And this bill is um, to allow suppressors, silencers on Guam. And I just want to, you know, do a little bit of a review of what we've got available to us on Guam right now. And that is, of course, Guam is in compliance with the Second Amendment. Been that way for years. Nothing is inhibiting our Second Amendment rights on Guam. In fact, in Guam, uh, we had a um, public hearing, a uh, an oversight hearing, a round table to discuss self-defense rights on Guam, which also are very strong. Persons on Guam, according to the Attorney General's office and the Public Defender's office who testified during those hearings, current self-defense law is codified in Chapter 7, Title 9, outlines basic rules as a justification, its limitations and the allowances. Definitions of lethal force and its limitations are also outlined. The composition of Guam's current self-defense laws permits for the application to a variety of cases. In cases where the evidence to support a self-defense justification is less defined or more complex, 
Guam law provides a legal framework for a jury to apply in order to determine justification and reasonableness of a person's conduct relative to the use of protective and lethal force. In fact, they said that Guam's law provides for the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that self-defense did not occur and if it should be invoked, stating that this provision makes Guam's self-defense law more robust than other states in the nation because of that huge, huge duty on the prosecutor to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt that self-defense did not occur. We've also passed laws to allow concealed weapons to, to ease the restrictions on concealed weapons. Public Law 32-150 passed in May of 2014. It allowed, it changed the law that authorized Guam Police Department to may issue a concealed firearms license that was on the discretion of the Chief of Police to shall issue a concealed firearms license. And this, and I just want to note that before that law was passed, there were about 100 concealed firearms licenses on Guam. The year that law was passed, it jumped from 100 to 600 concealed firearms licenses on Guam, and in the next year jumped to 800 license, concealed firearms licenses on Guam. So the right to bear arms and to bear concealed ar firearms on Guam is, is also very strong and alive. They also passed the Castle Doctrine, which allows that you can protect your castle, your home, and pretty much if you claim self-defense, you are protected from an investigation, that the presumption is, is in your favor. If you shoot a firearm in your home, you do not have to prove self-defense. You are going to be presumed that you acted in self-defense. We also have hunting permits that are granted every year. There is no impediment to those who want to obtain hunting licenses, pretty much, uh, in general. And this bill, again, is to allow silencers. Silencers on top of concealed firearms, or suppressors. And I just want to, you know, when I think about this bill, you know, there are, there are arguments in regards to the hearing of it, which I would like to go in detail about. But, but overall, you know, we have to weigh protection of our community and whether, you know, we can protect those users of these firearms and their hearing. And I agree with the previous speaker that when we are looking at a rise of crime in our communities, the use of firearms, the a rise in, in the number of concealed firearms that are available and being carried, and the ability of law enforcement to detect the use of firearms in our communities when they are not required to carry them you know, openly or, or to visibly, I think we need to weigh in on, on the side of law enforcement officers to detect this. And in, in fact, on the side of all members of our community to detect the use of firearms. To ensure that they can hear clearly gunshots in their vicinity. That they can protect themselves and their families when gunshots when guns are being used in their communities. And that, so Bill 73 was reported out as introduced. Many who testified cited the benefit of silencers and suppressors to help protect from hearing loss or damage, especially with regular training where a gun fires repeatedly. The use of silencers for officer safety training as an added hearing protection is reasonable 
for a limited lifting of restrictions on the use of silencers or suppressors. However, this is not what this bill does. This bill grants lawful possession of silencers subject to current qualifications in federal law, rules, and regulations for legal gun ownership to every member of our community, not just to law enforcement. No, no amendments were made to the bill to specify use of these devices for training purposes in a controlled training environment. The American Speech Language Hearing Association stated that the suppressors cannot reduce the noise caused by supersonic flight of the projectile breaking the sound barrier once it leaves the barrel of the firearm. Suppressors can reduce firearms to approximately 140 decibels, but this is still quite audible and potentially hazardous to hearing. So we'll, we won't fully achieve the purpose that is stated for the for passage of this bill either. The ASHA, American Speech Language Hearing Association, also stated there is no standardized measurement protocol to assess the effectiveness of a suppressor. This means manufacturers cannot assure firearms users that they can adequately protect their hearing solely by using a suppressor. To effectively protect hearing, recreational firemen users Firearms users should always wear proper HPSs, even when firearms are equipped with suppressors. They also state that there are hearing enhancements and hearing protections available. Hearing enhancers can reduce gunshot noise. They recommend for hunters or professional shooters to protect from hearing loss and with devices that are legal, available, and are not points of contention with regard to safety. The nonlinear hearing protection devices that let soft and moderate sounds pass while attenuating loud, intense sounds. Moderately attenuating high fidelity HPDs that provide less attenuation and uniformly reduce sound across the entire frequency range. Custom earplugs for professional hunters or shooters that comprise an actual mode of your ear canal taken by a hearing professional. Electronic shooter earplugs with digital sound technology that works to compress noise above a harmful decibel level and enhance quieter levels. There are some devices that have advanced background noise reduction to reduce ambient white noise for enhanced clarity. Reusable shooter earplugs, commonly known foam material, moldable putty-like material, or more structured silicon. At the hearing, I asked questions specific to verifying if silencers distort the natural sound of gunfire. I'm concerned that the distortion from the suppression will make it harder to determine that it is gunfire and where the gunfire is coming from. And I do not believe that in the course of the public hearing that we have clear confirmation of this or clear information in answer to these questions. The loud and distinctive noise of a gunshot is important in protecting our community against gunshots. It's what is, alerts us to the realization that we may need to run, hide, or protect others. It is what alerts law enforcement. We've heard in recent news the case of Marshall Sablan Elementary School going into lockdown three times this year, once in November, twice in October, because they heard the sound of gunshots around the campus. Because they recognized the sound, they were able to immediately initiate safety protocols in each case and contact GPD. Thankfully, there was not an active shooter on the campus. In one of the articles, Superintendent Fernandez noted that hunters frequent the area surrounding the school and had been the source of gunfire in previous years. And, and you know, that was speculation as to what, where the gunshot might have come from this time. We've not been presented with any data that addresses our unique landscape or similar ones that verify that suppressed gunfire will not be distorted and affect our ability to determine the direction that it is coming from. I'd like to note that the National Law Enforcement Partnership to Prevent Gun Violence was opposed to H.R. 367, the Duncan Carter Hearing Protection Act of 2017, and S-59, the Hearing Protection Act in the Senate. They opposed the legislation because it would remove silencers and from regulation under the National Firearm Act and put officers and the public at, quote, grave risk, unquote. They stated that, quote, the truth is that silencers are seldom used in crimes, 
because since 1934, their manufacturing cell has been tightly controlled. Transfers of the devices are closely tracked. Sanctions for using a silencer in a crime are severe. And these facts led to the inevitable, inevitable conclusion that the current legislative regulatory scheme has worked exceptionally well, just as it has with legally registered machine guns and other firearms listed on the NFA. And this brings me to the most important point, Madam Speaker, is that the Guam Police Department submitted written testimony on Bill 7336. And they are recommending that we, we enact laws, if we are to enact a law allowing silencers or suppressors, that we also enact a whole slew of other recommendations that they have uh, suggested to us. And I think it's very important that we, we heed their advice. And we don't, again, pass a law authorizing the silencers before we pass the protections that GPD has asked us to put in place. And they're very clear. They want our penalties, rules, procedures, and fees to ensure that we mirror federal laws. Those are not part of this bill. It says we will comply with federal law, but it does not uh, it require that pursuant to Guam law, not enforceable by our Guam GPD. Governance of the purchase, ownership, and use of suppressors and silencing devices. That's their first one. GPD stated, establishing a way to verify and prove validity of the federal documents should be considered and a process to verify should be done before a Guam approved registration can be completed. They further stated, an individual may not be able to legally purchase these devices without proper federal registration, but individual exchange of the device could become possible on island if the federal documents cannot be verified during a registration process. Someone that has been approved and obtained the required federal approval could legally transfer the device to someone with a counterfeit federal, doc federal document if there's no way to verify the federal document. So they're asking that we put that in place first. Second, they ask that requirements of a licensed and registered federal firearms licensed dealer be being a conduit for obtaining through new ownership purchase all devices coming to Guam. We suggest, they said, GPD stated, we suggest that this requirement be applied to the devices. This suggestion would assist in verifying legal purchase of devices coming to Guam and further assist in tracking and registering legal devices on island. This requirement is not in the bill, Madam Speaker. The legal transfer, it, GPD stated in its trust testimony, a specific language in the Guam statute should require the federal BATF process be completed and approved with proof of completion and approval before any legal transfer of ownership can be approved and the device registered with GPD by the new owner. This will assist in trying to ensure device ownership is not transferred without the required federal approval on island. GPD stated, there should be similar statutes defining the time to register devices by people who move to Guam or are visiting for a substantial time and are in possession of devices that need to be registered as defined by the statutes. GPD also stated, we suggest a fee be identified and codified in the statute for registration of each device. This fee will help with processing costs associated with the process. GPD proposed penalties for criminal use of suppressors, silencers as follows. And again, they're proposing them because they do not exist. These penalties will not, do not exist even after passage of this proposed bill. Illegal manufacturer, Illegal manufacturer or suppressor silencer will be considered a felony. Use of a suppressor silencer in the commission of a crime is a felony. Possession of an unregistered suppressor silencer is a felony. Possession of a suppressor silencer without a firearms ID card is a felony. Finally, while we know that registered gun owners are law-abiding citizens that follow gun laws normally, those who disregard the law and the safety of our community Uh, also have the potential for these devices to get into their hands because of our relaxing of the restrictions. With our current ongoing challenges that law enforcement are facing on Guam, and, you know, I would ask that we not further burden our community, further make it harder for them to identify gunshot in their vicinities, further make it harder for schools to 
identify gunshot and to react promptly, uh, and, and all other members of our community to detect whether gunshots are being fired in the vicinity of their homes especially. And that uh, we continue to allow for the community to hear undistorted uh, gunshot for their protection. And that we, we encourage you know, the other alternatives that have been proposed as to protection of hearing. Or, because of all the arguments that have been made that this is, bill is really intended for, for you know, law enforcement, I want to note, Madam Speaker, this bill did not come to us from GPD. It was not a proposal by GPD for its need that it, it was necessary to increase their training capacity. None of that was presented as testimony. And so I believe that they do have ways to ensure training is done, it has been done all these years, and to ensure protection of hearing as well, you know, with the alternate measures that would not put the burden on, on the public. Sidious Masi. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On bill number 73, Senator Moylan, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank my colleague for introducing this bill. I agree with the bill. I think it's quite simple what, what the, uh, how it was introduced. It simply a one, two, three, four sentences un underlined. That's adding to allow mufflers, silencers, or devices or deadening the sound of discharge of firearms are permitted provided that the specifications, purchase, ownership, and the possession of the devices complies, complies with the applicable federal laws, rules, and regulations. Follow the federal laws, follow the federal regulations, follow the rules. I don't have a silencer, but, uh, but I can recall the days when I was a uh, uh, an army soldier, just like the sponsor of this bill. And we used to run around with our, well, train with our M16s. And at that time, you had your, uh, your I'll give you some terms to, to understand, a suppressor when you fired blanks. And you got your, these earplugs in your ears. But I tell you what, even though you're firing blanks and you have a suppressor, a suppressor is the one that goes at the end of the muscle on the weapon. So no projectile comes out. It's still loud. I would push those earplugs into my ears as much as possible. And during our training, uh, this is federal training, right? And you can hear where you're practicing maneuvers on which direction that firing is coming from just by firing blanks. 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, you call it out. Because you can hear the sound, whether it be on automatic or whether it be on semi-automatic. You know where the sound is coming from. And that's just firing blanks. It's loud. And all the days on the ranges and all the earplugs I got in my ear, uh, when, when you're qualifying with your weapon, that's loud as well. So I, I see no, if, if, if you're honestly using this for the purpose of legal, legally and you're, you're enjoying your weapon, you're going to the firing range and not shooting around the, your block and breaking it out and trying to shoot somebody's chicken or somebody's car, you're, you're going to the firing range. Everything else is illegal. So utilize the suppressor. That's, that's what this bill is trying to do. And it's still going to be loud. When you use regular ammunition without the flash suppressor, when you got a projectile coming out of the muzzle, it's going to be loud. And with a silencer, it's not going to be pew, pew, pew. It's going to be loud. Officers are trained. Soldiers are trained. You can tell where the rounds are coming from. Young students in school don't, never even heard of a gunshot before, but they know where it's coming from because it's loud. So if people want to do this legally and, and uh, wish to use a suppressor, this is what this bill is doing. 
and it's permitted to provide the specifications in the purchase and the ownership and possession of the devices which complies with applicable federal laws, rules, and regulations. Madam Speaker, I support this bill, and I ask my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. And Bill number 73-36-COR, is there anyone else who'd like to be recognized? Senator Paris, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, yeah, after listening to the, the, the discussion, it's, it, it's clear to me that I think we should be very cautious about um, removing the ban on silencers outright. Um, you know, looking at what's happening nationally, uh, I know in the bill itself it says that um, there is a, a rigorous process, in the, a rigorous federal process to uh, obtain silencers but what we're seeing in the national scene is they're, they're trying to uh, decrease the rigorousness of that. So the Hearing Protection Act, for one, what it would do if it passes in Congress, it would make buying silencers similar to buying a hunting rifle, which has no federal waiting period, and it would, re it would remove the fee of $200. So I think it's very critical that uh, we develop these rules if, we, if this is the policy that we want to make to allow for silencers. I also want to share with you uh, one of the statements made by David Chipman, who's a senior policy advisor at the Americans for Responsible Solutions, a retired 25-year-old veteran at the ATF. He views as laxing of uh, silencers or obtaining of silencers as a threat to public safety. And again, it, it's, re and it's relative to the ability for law enforcement to identify the location of a shooter. He points to the case of Christopher Dorner, a former Los Angeles police officer who used silencers during a two-day killing spree in 2013. And um, again, I do uh, want to, you know, express caution about, you know, un removing these, these protections that have proven to be very effective. I think in regards to um, our law enforcement, I think it's important that we support their training. And I do have two amendments to proffer. Uh, I don't know if that's uploaded yet. Take a 30 second recess or one minute recess.
Could we, could we please get the copies distributed?
We're back from recess. Senator Paris, you had the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The First Amendment is line 10 to 11, page 4. It reads, um, well, I'll read this, the previous sentence. Uh, mufflers, silencers, or devices for deadening the sound of discharged firearms are also prohibited except for law enforcement safety training. And again, this addresses the occupational hazards with the uh, discharge of firearms. Is there anyone who'd like to be heard on the amendment? Amendment's been passed out and also uploaded by the clerks. It's uh, corrected by the clerks to read SFP TMT as sponsor. Senator Ada on the amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have to stand in objection to this amendment. Once again, here we are trying to keep our law-abiding citizens from availing themselves of uh, this hearing protection. Madam Speaker, I think what we fail to understand is that anyone with a criminal intent will do everything they can to circumvent law and they will find a way to avail themselves of a suppressor. And I'm not sure whether any one of my colleagues know, but you go right online and you can see how a suppressor is made on a do-it-yourself on YouTube. So I think that these types of amendments, again, takes our law-abiding citizens and ties their hands. Anyone with criminal intent will circumvent the law, no matter what law we pass. And I, I asked my colleagues, go on YouTube, Google suppressors, do it yourself. You buy an oil filter up at Kmart, you put an adapter on it, and you drill a hole right through it, and you have a homemade suppressor. Now, these are the types of amendments that are foolish. Because we continue, like I said, to bind the hands of law-abiding citizens. Once again, I object, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, on the amendment. Senator Duenas, your recognition. Madam Speaker, I also rise in objection to the amendment for many of the same reasons that the previous speaker just discussed. In, in my testimony on the bill, I discussed that it, this is not just law enforcement and training. It is individuals who, who carry on making a living after getting out of law enforcement, after doing service in the military, after other reasons by which they used and had to use firearms as part of their duties. Madam Speaker, I feel as though when amendments such as this and the other amendment that's been proffered, now they should just be standalone bills. If that, if that's, because you're, you're departing from the intent of this bill. And, and it really is, a, I just think, just a, a reason to, to try to water down or, or, or to try to change the entire direction when really what we're doing here is we're discussing everything outside of the intent of the bill. All of the reason to narrowly focus as a, as a retiring speaker on those who law-abiding citizens, citizens of our territory, of our island, who want to avail themselves of this opportunity for many different reasons, but all we sit here and discuss is, is the criminal element. I don't know how many times we have to say it, but a criminal is not going to go and apply and do everything that's required to be able to get a suppressor. So, you know, I, I understand why the retiring speaker basically gets upset at these type of attempts because if you want to do this, then just introduce a standalone bill if, if this bill doesn't pass, if that's the purpose and what you want to do because you're so concerned about that. Then just do it as a standalone measure. But Madam Speaker, it's very clear, and yes, you mentioned some issues that were represented in the testimony, but it was very clear by the majority of those testifying or those who are doing training on ranges, those who are training, and you know we talk about what's happening nationally. 
what's happening nationally, the folks on the, on the range are telling us there are more people that are getting firearms every single day now because of the environment that we live in. It's getting worse, not better, and people are arming themselves. So they're going to have to go and train on the range to stay away from the criminals or protect themselves from criminals. We hear testimony on, you know, what, what are we doing about people flagging weapons within the village? It's a crime. I, I, you know, no, none of us can stand here and say why there haven't been arrests effectuated or whatever else it is. But not allowing suppressors is not going to stop that. So I just hope that we'll continue to understand what the intent, vote it up or down, but, but that we continue to understand the intent and the reason and not dissuade the focus from that. Because believe me, gun sales nationally are skyrocketing. That's a fact, Madam Speaker. And it's because people are feel less and less safe and individuals who are obtaining those weapons are going to be training on those weapons. They're going to be everyday average citizens, law-abiding citizens. They deserve that right to have every bit of protection when I'm sure as a law-abiding citizen, you're going to train and you're going to retrain and you're going to make sure you're proficient with a weapon to protect yourself, unfortunately, nowadays in your own home. So I also rise in objection to this amendment. Excuse me, Madam Speaker. So just want to see Senator on the amendment. On the amendment. Senator Shelton.
Speaker Terlahi, you are recognized. Masi. I stand in support of this amendment. We've heard much talk about how this is necessary for those who make a living protecting us and that we should allow them to be trained. And that is actually what is exactly recognized in some of the other states where they make exceptions to the prohibitions on silencers or suppressors, like Hawaii. The exception is made for federal and state law enforcement and other officials. New York, the exception for law enforcement performing their official duties. And I would ask that we on Guam also make this recognition that if we want our law enforcement to be trained better than the criminals, that we allow them to train and we protect their hearing. And that we, we if they need, if they cannot protect their hearing, I, you know, as I stated earlier in, in my remarks on the bill, there are other ways to protect their hearing. And um, that will not put the burden on the public by suppressing the sound of a firearm in the vicinity, in our neighborhoods, near our schools. And this is exactly how they train schools to respond to the sounds of the, the firearms. So I, you know, again, our own law enforcement has asked us that if we are going to allow suppressors on Guam, that we require all these other things, the list that they gave us, that we require those concurrently with making any changes to the ban on suppressors that currently exists. And this bill does not do that. So this amendment attempts to make up for that and to continue to protect law enforcement and to continue to protect our community by making an exception in this bill on a very limited basis, on the basis that was promulgated, that those who need to continuously train these law enforcement officers for protection of all of us, that they will be allowed to do this when they are training and, and allow it on that limited basis until a bill can be brought that adequately addresses GPD's concerns and adequately puts in place the restrictions and requirements and the penalties that GPD has very specifically asked us to do if we want to attempt to amend our suppressor, uh, suppressor prohibition. So I stand in support of this amendment. Sajosmasi, Madam Speaker, on the amendment, there has been an objection to the amendment. All those Allow the sponsor to close. Thank you, Madam Chair, or Madam Speaker. Yeah, again, I, I ask for my colleagues' support on this amendment. I think, you know, before we move forward and um, remove the ban on silencers, we really have to address the concerns of our, our public safety and law enforcement. And, um, you know, I think we should limit it to, to the safety training for law enforcement rather than open it up to the community at large without really knowing the full impacts. I mean, we already hear that the, there are concerns about um, the distortion uh, affecting the ability to, to determine the location of the, the shooter. And, uh, you know, we're a tiny island and, you know, we want to be sure that, uh, you know, if we are going to uh, lax decrease the protections in in our in our laws uh, that could diminish the effect of our law enforcement um, we really have to be very careful and, and create these rules and regs um, so that uh, we're not uh, subject to changes in the national you know laws that can can lessen the effect or lessen the protections or the rigorous the rigors in um, allowing um, the public to purchase these silencers. So I think really, you know, as far as intent, you know, the intent is about protecting the hear, you know, prevent, prevention of hearing loss, right? But I think that 
again, the issues of public safety fall into this. I think it's very much connected uh, to this bill and we should not be, we should not neglect those concerns. And uh, it's very much, I think, very much relevant to this bill. So I ask uh, my colleagues for their support with this amendment. Thank you. Sidious Masi, Senator Perez. There has been an objection to the amendment. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Amendment fails. Senator Perez, you are still recognized. Okay, this amendment is in section four. It states mufflers, silencers, and devices for deadening the sound of discharge firearms are permitted for law enforcement safety training, provided that specifications, purchase, ownership, and possession of the device complies with applicable federal laws, rules, and regulations. So again, it's pretty much um, similar to the first amend previous amendment where we would be limiting it to law enforcement. Um, so in that way, we're balancing the, the public safety uh, as well as protecting um, the law enforcement officers who are uh, using firearms uh, or potentially be using these firearms. On the amendment, Senator Ada, you are recognized. Thanks again, Madam Speaker. And once again, I stand in objection to this amendment. And this is another example of tying our law-abiding citizens' hands. It just seems that we continue to, to want to tie their hands from being able to, you know, I'm just going to keep it at that, Madam Speaker, because sometimes I think that, uh, you know, it, comprehension does not continue on when we just keep talking because we said it all in the First Amendment, and here we are again wanting to limit it to law enforcement. What makes, what makes us think that our own citizens don't want to train just as well and protect their hearing just as well? It makes no sense whatsoever, Madam Speaker. Again, I stand in objection to this amendment. Thank you. Situas Masi, Senator Ada, on the amendment. Senator Duenas, you are recognized. Mr. Masi, Madam Speaker, I'll keep it short as well. I, I think it's really important to understand and uh, maybe, maybe there'll be another explanation, but from what I understand, all federal laws applying to Guam trump local law. And I believe if we need to codify the federal law, we can do that. I don't think that's gonna be a huge problem for us. We do it all the time. It's not as though it's, an act of Congress to codify a federal law. But I believe, I believe, should this bill pass and become local law, and even the use of a silencer, suppressor, or any type of device in the commission of a crime, a felony, or anything else, you probably, and more than likely, I could probably put my next paycheck on it, will already activate ATF and other federal law enforcement to investigate and, and, and add charges to whatever would be brought. To have that instrument to begin with and commit a crime right now or use it for any other purpose. It's the purpose why we're trying to allow for law abiding citizens, responsible individuals, responsible with firearms to be able to obtain what is otherwise legal in most jurisdictions. So to think for a moment that the lack of codification of federal law makes it open season, I guess to use a gun reference, is just faults on its face. So I stand on objection to this amendment. So just Mossy, Madam Speaker. So just Masi, Senator Duenas, on the amendment. <laughs> Senator Nelson, Majority Leader Nelson, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I just want to point out um, some things, right? In, some, in the states that do authorize gun, silent, gun suppressors, firearm suppressors, these are some of the criteria that they have. So you have to be a resident of the United States. 
You have to reside in the state, of course. You must be eligible to purchase a firearm. You must be at least 21 years of age to purchase a silencer from a licensed silencer dealer. Be at least 18 years of age to purchase a silencer from an individual on Form 4 to Form 4 to transfer con contingent on state laws. Be at least 18 years of age to possess a silencer as a beneficiary of a trust or as a member of a corporation. Pass a BT BATFA criminal background check, which is basically what we do here, and then pay a one-time fee of $200, one-time tax stamp fee. And so, you know, a lot of these um, requirements were included in the legislation. So I see that uh, we are trying to produce amendments also that would guarantee further protection if we should move forward voting for this bill. Um, and just to note that um, in some of the In some of the research, they also provide different decibel levels um, with the firearm suppressor. So basically, if you have a 22, your firearm decibel level is at 119 and 129. That's with the suppressor. And anything after that, like if you're shooting like a, a weapon or a firearm that is a 5.56 five, round, it's 135 to 140 plus. And so basically the threshold of pain, because we're advocating that it's going to save our hearing if we use firearm suppressors, um, and we feel that one colleague stated that the earplugs was not adequate, it still provides the same amount of threshold of pain when you were to fire a 5.56 five, uh, without, uh, without the earplugs. So uh, I just don't buy it that if you put on your earplugs, it doesn't, it, it won't protect your safety. As a matter of fact, if you use your earplugs properly and you follow the instructions on how to put it on, it would protect your hearing. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is U.S. Mossy, Senator Nelson. On the Paris Amendment, Speaker Terlahi, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, I support this amendment. This amendment would allow a very limited exception on Guam for silencers. It would only allow silencers for law enforcement training. That's what so many of the sponsors or the, the yeah, the, the co-sponsors of this bill have claimed their motivation is. And we've been told that this amendment by limiting silencers to only law enforcement would tie law-abiding citizens' hands. And I strongly object to that sentiment, Madam Speaker, because that's what I'm trying, that's, that's false. On Guam, there is nothing tying law-abiding citizens' hands from owning guns. As I said, our Second Amendment is alive and well here on Guam self-defense, the use of those firearms is alive and well here on Guam in self-defense. Concealed weapons are allowed here on Guam, and we've seen a massive increase in the amount of concealed weapons. Hunting permits, those are alive and well here on Guam as well. The Castle Doctrine, protection of your home, alive and well. We've seen even court cases where, no, where the burden of proof has been in favor of those using the firearms in protection of their homes. And in fact, it actually restricts investigation when self-defense is claimed in those cases. This floor amendment ensures that we do not tie the hands of everyday citizens trying to protect their homes, our schools, protects our law enforcement officers, allows them, helps them to do their jobs by continu continuing to prevent the distortion that comes with silencers on gunfire. When we distort the sound of the gunfire, we are distorting the ability of our community to detect gunfire promptly, to detect where it's coming from, to notify officials, 
And until we are able to put in place what GPD is recommending that we do, we have no business allowing suppressors. You want to follow federal laws? Well, GPD is proposing that federal law, if we cannot adopt some of these things locally, is not going to protect us from the transfer of suppressors obtained legally under federal law but transferred on Guam because there's no requirement in this bill to even register your suppressor on Guam. That's what they're asking for, that we put in mandates that that is the responsible thing to do here, that if we're going to allow an exception and allow this distortion of gunfire to and to allow the distortion of the detection of gunfire that we actually put in, in here some protections for GPD as well so that they can control who owns these things. They will have a registry that they can, that there are penalties that match the danger of allowing this. And this is what is done in other jurisdictions. There aren't just blanket other jurisdictions also put these local laws in place. And this bill does not do that. It removes the ban without putting in any protections for our police officers and for our public, more importantly, our school students. I'm very concerned about that. So this does not in any way tie law-abiding citizens' hands. It prohibits, this amendment would continue to prohibit silencers and the distortion of the sound of firearms in a community so that they can be promptly detected. And it would especially do that while we wait for, for the protections that GPD has also recommend it to us. They took the time and wrote them all out. This bill is not incorporating any of those. So whose hands are we tying here? We're allowing gun owners who may have great intentions but can protect their hearing in other ways. We're allowing their concern for their hearing to prevail over the concerns of GPD and to prevail over the concerns of the, and the security of our communities. And I'm telling you, the only real way anyone has ever detected firearm use in a community is by the sounds, unless we find a dead body hours later. But if we want to detect that promptly, it's the sound. That's how the 911 calls come in, fire, you know, shooting in my area. We've seen the studies, how they're you know, arguably unable in some instances to, to di discern between different sounds when there are suppressors being used on firearms. So while we wait for GPD's recommendations to be implemented, I say we continue the ban unless we are going to allow it, as this amendment proposes, strictly for law enforcement training under very controlled circumstances. And, a way, and, a very control, and GPD can very much control that. And if we are not willing to give GPD the tools that it needs to protect us, then I think it's irresponsible for us to remove this ban. Sito Smasi. Sito Smasi, Speaker. On the Paris Amendment. Senator Paris, you may close. I think is again, it's important that we limit it to training only. Um, you know, by opening it up to the greater public at large, then basically the police are losing that um, advantage in, in, in enacting their duties. And I think that's the other issue is, you know, the public safety um, is, is at, at risk, I think. And, and it's been testified according to some, I, I said it earlier, um, a veteran of 25 years of ATF said it is, it could be a threat to public safety 
And I think that's the, the perspective that I'm taking uh, because we don't have these safeguards in place if we're opening it up to the community at large. All right, thank you. Thank you, Senator Perez. There has been an objection to the amendment. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Amendment fails. Senator Perez? Thank you. On the main motion, bill number 73-36. Senator Ada, you may close. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you to my colleagues for the debate on uh, 7336. You know, it's been said, I think not once, but twice, a couple of times, about the easing of restrictions on issuing concealed firearms. Not sure how, how it any, had any, uh, any, uh, connection to suppressors, but the, the, the speaker had mentioned that, uh, my colleague had mentioned that prior to the passage of the concealed carry firearms, that only 100 individuals had a concealed carry. The year after that, it went up to 600, and following that, it went up to 800. You know what is the difference between those 500 to 700 folk, 700 people who got concealed carry? The first 100 were not trained. Those who have gotten their concealed carry firearms through the law that was passed had a requirement to be trained by a certified instructor. That's fact. Because I introduced that law. And I made sure there was a provision there. So yes, we have 800 concealed carry firearms individuals out there, but they are trained by certified instructors. Unlike prior the first 100 were just issued at the will and pleasure of the chief. It was also brought up about Castle Doctrine. Nowhere in the Castle Doctrine law does it, does it mention a firearm, nowhere. Castle Doctrine allows an individual to protect themselves without having to retreat. It gives them that ability to not be the victim twice by the perpetrator, by the justice system. That's what Castle Doctrine did. It didn't say you can use a firearm. Heck, if you had a size D battery and you threw it to the individual and he knocked him out, then so be it. But you're protecting yourself. We have many incidents that have happened throughout the years, and more so the past couple of years. And I didn't see any mad rush to introduce legislation to prohibit slingshots, bow and arrow, machete, and as 
recent bones. You can't hear where they're coming from. Trust me, you can't. You cannot see where a machete, you can't hear a machete coming. You can't see an arrow coming. You can't even hear it. So to say that this suppressor, lifting the ban on suppressor, is going to, is going to say that we won't be able to detect where it's coming from, you can't detect where these instruments are coming from. There are federal regulations in place that we did not take out. So no, we are not saying that you don't have to abide by the federal law. We, it's in the bill. You must abide by all federal rules and regulations. When an individual files the Form 4, a copy of that form must be given to the chief of police. So yes, he will be notified as to an individual applying for a suppressor. All the delays on this bill is just tactics, Madam Speaker. And like I said previously, those who want to circumvent the law, have the criminal intent for the law, will find a way. Because criminals will always find a way. Law-abiding citizens, on the other hand, follow the rules and regulations. I said previously, if an individual wanted to, they can just go on YouTube. It's there. So, once again, the criminal with the criminal intent would do what they want to do. Let's give our law abiding citizens that opportunity to be able to go out there. Purchase a suppressor. Madam Speaker, it takes eight months to ten months to get approved. And not just by our local chief of police, but we're talking about the federal government, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. There's a slew of forms that need to be filled out. There's processes and procedures in place federally that our people must abide by. So no, they are not just going to get a suppressor and that's it. They must abide by their rules and regulations and there are penalties federally for it if they break the law. You know, Madam Speaker, I've been in the death care industry for over 30 years. And I have seen more people succumb to their injuries by other means than firearms. More individuals have been stabbed, beheaded, killed by other means besides firearms. Again, if an individual has a criminal intent, they will commit a crime. Let's not be in the way of our law-abiding citizens. I humbly ask for my colleagues' support. I ask them to please vote on Bill 7336. And I just have one amendment, Madam Speaker, and that's to add co-sponsors. Uh, Senator Brown, Senator Tidegui, Senator Torres, and Senator Nelson. Thank you. You don't want it.
without Senator Nelson. On the motion to place uh, Senators Brown, Taitigui, Torres as co-sponsors, is there any objection? Hearing and seeing no objection, motion carries. Sponsor is. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to place Bill uh, 7336 to the third reading. Thank On you. On the motion to place Bill 73-36 to the third reading file, is there any objection? Seeing no objection, motion carries. We're now on Bill number 97-36. Uh, Legislative Secretary Shelton, you are recognized. Sajis Masi, Madam Speaker. I move to place Bill number 97-36 LS as amended by the committee onto the third reading file and I ask for the opportunity to speak on the measure. Please proceed. Sajuas Masi, Madam Speaker, I first want to thank the Guam Youth Congress for their foresight in passing this bill during their session earlier this year and for their continued advocacy on behalf of the youth of Guam. As chair on the advancement of youth, I was honored to introduce this bill on their behalf to address the issue of period poverty in our schools. Madam Speaker, a little more than half of the population of Guam will likely menstruate every month for decades of their lives, including but not limited to thousands of young women and girls in our schools. It's unfortunate the fact that many on our island live with limited means, means only further worsened by a global pandemic. And faced with this reality, oftentimes families must prioritize other needs over hygiene products for their children. These children are not in control of their financial situations and not in control of what their family can and cannot afford. And so these young women should not suffer for an essential function of their physiology. According to a youth poll taken this year, 23% of students struggle to afford menstrual hygiene products. 51% of these girls have worn period products for longer than recommended, and one in four have missed class because of a lack of these products. This issue is often overlooked, but it is time to pay attention. This bill means to address this issue and ensure that every young woman will be able to participate in daily school life with dignity. This measure will provide equity so that a young woman won't have to use rags, toilet paper, or other substitutes that may cause infections. A couple of pads a month free of charge will go a long way to ensure that a young woman is concentrated on her studies. Madam Speaker, this is a matter of basic hygiene. And during our fiscal year 2022 budget discussions, we were able to offer an amendment that allocated $100,000 from GDOE's annual appropriations towards menstrual hygiene products for public school students. And this bill further codifies what is already funded for and ensures that every year after FY 2022, schools can provide for our young women and girls. Madam Speaker, I'd also like to inform this body that the committee amended the bill to expand the requirements to provide menstrual hygiene products to institutions of higher learning, the University of Guam and the Guam Community College, as recommended by the Guam Youth Congress in their testimony. And as for the cost of procuring these products, the Bureau of Budget and Management Research initially anticipated that should the bill be enacted, there will be a financial cost impact to the Guam Department of Education from $200,000 to $300,000 in the Guam Academy Charter Schools from somewhere between $23,000 to $36,000. Mrs. Jane Flores, the Director of the Bureau of Women's Affairs, provided testimony regarding the cost impact of the bill, noting that the estimates provided by BBMR were a bit inflated and should be at least a third of that, what BBMR anticipated. Mrs. Flores further noted that the BBMR estimates include the cost of tampons, 
which she said do not need to be accounted for because schools will be providing basic menstrual pads. This bill recognizes a simple fact of biology and removes the barriers to education that many of our young women and girls face today. Schools already offer soap and toilet paper free of charge, and now we have the opportunity here to provide our young women in schools with the basic needs of pads. And Madam Speaker, I ask uh, you and our colleagues that we are able today to ensure that these young women won't fall behind in school or feel any type of shame because of this bodily function. And I humbly ask our colleagues for their support of this bill. Sizuas Masi. Sizuas Masi, Senator. On Bill Number 97-36LS, as amended by the committee, is there anyone who'd like to be recognized? Senator Nelson, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in support of this uh, bill. Um, as trivial as it may sound that we have to enact legislation to afford feminine hygiene products for our youth, uh, it is a huge reality for a lot of people in our community, our, a lot of our young girls, um, especially in the schools. Um, some of them will elect not to go to school if they don't have the proper feminine hygiene products, so they miss out in several days of classroom instruction and puts them behind in the classwork. Also, some of the challenges are, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, as a teacher in the classroom, we've seen accidents happen in these kind of cases, and it really, um, uh, the young girls are very embarrassed about the situations, and in, in, in instances, they are bullied and teased uh, for these kinds of mishaps. And so, uh, providing these to our children, providing these products to our children and to our young girls um, is something that we can do to ensure that they are able to come to school and um, be confident in, in what they are doing. Senator, is there anyone else who'd like to be recognized? Bill number 97-36. Senator Rigel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I also rise in support of the measure. Um, I think this is a good bill and it's something important. Um, it's a fact that there is a lot of poverty in the schools. And I think uh, what attests to that fact is the fact that every single Guam public school was granted the ability to provide a free lunch program. That's because they determined there were enough people with financial difficulties in these schools, people of lower income, that allowed all, every single public school on Guam to qualify for that federal free lunch program. So if we're gonna provide kids with free lunch because we understand that there are many kids in our public school system that come from low-income families, it just makes sense to me that we should also provide uh, feminine hygiene products as well um, for kids who come from families that may have difficulty in getting these products themselves. So with that, I rise in full support of the measure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Is there anyone else who'd like to be recognized on Bill number 97-36? If not, then the sponsor may close. Senator Shelton, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleagues for uh, their support of this measure, and again, to thank the Guam Youth Congress for their foresight, their advocacy for their peers, and the future children of Guam, the future young women of Guam who will attend schools. And I ask again our colleagues for their support of this measure. Sidious Masi. On the motion to place Bill Number 97-36LS as amended by the committee on the third reading file, is there any objection? Hearing and seeing no objection, motion carries. We're now on Bill Number 106-36, COR. Senator Men Moylan, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Bill 106-36, CORE. 
As amended by the Committee on Public Safety, Emergency Response, Military and Veteran Affairs, Mayor's Council and Public Transit. It's introduced by myself, co-sponsor Senator Joseph Augustine, Senator Peter Talahi, and Senator Frank Bloss. It's an act to add subsection 6010911111 to Chapter 60, Title 10, Guam Code Annotated, relative to including police precincts to the list of exceptions where an authorized individual shall not openly carry a firearm or carry a concealed weapon. Um, Madam Speaker, this bill was discussed in our prior session on session floor, uh, however, did not uh, make it to third reading file uh, due to the five day notification. Uh, therefore, we have previously discussed this bill on session floor and considering our uh, wanting to move through our agenda as uh, thoroughly as possible, I, I would like to request uh, my colleagues that we just move this 10636 into third reading file and not have discussion on this bill. Madam Speaker. Is this Mossy Senator? We're it's not a motion. It's a, we're still having discussion on the bill. bill on bill number 106-36 COR, is any, anyone else who'd like to be recognized? Any senator on 106? If not, then the sponsor may close. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, there was no changes from the last discussion we had on, one, one of, on, on this bill on the floor. Basically, it's removing the uh, opportunity for anybody to come into the police department uh, to bear a firearm while, while filing a, any situation they have. So no, no changes from, the, um, from last session. So I thank my colleagues for this opportunity and look forward to uh, moving this into a third reading file for a vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Speaker, thank you. Thank you, Senator Moylan. On the motion to place Bill Number 106-36 COR as amended by the committee on the third reading. Is there any objection? Hearing and seeing no objection. Motion carries. Majority Leader Senator Nelson, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Earlier today, we completed the debate for our resolutions, and so I'd like to make a motion that we move into the third reading voting file to vote on resolution numbers 153-36, 178-36, 199-36, and resolution number 2-36. All of which are 200-36. All of which are. Um, under LS, and without engrossment, there were no amendments made to these resolutions. And in the interest of time, some of these are being heard up at the House in the upcoming days, and so we'd like to see if we can move on them to show the support for the actions within the committees that they correspond to. Senator Nelson, if you don't mind, could you just please repeat the, the, num the bill numbers, I mean the resolution numbers? Yes. The resolution numbers are resolution number 153-36 LS, resolution number 178-36 LS, resolution number 199-36 LS, and resolution number 200-36 LS. Senator Perez, on that motion. And to add resolution 203-36 LS. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 210, 203, and 153. Those are the other resolutions. That's correct. So that would be all the resolutions that we have discussed today. The motion is to vote on these without engrossment. Is there any objection to that motion? Hearing and seeing no objection. That motion carries. 
And we will take a five minute recess for the clerks to upload those to the third reading and to pass out copies uh, before we vote. Five minute recess.
We're, good afternoon, colleagues. We're back on third reading. We're, we are now on the third reading file, pursuant to a motion to vote on the resolutions without engrossment. Hard copies have been passed. Is there anyone that requires more time? If not, then I will ask the clerks to please read the title of the resolutions without engrossment, and please note that the titles are without engrossment. We'll begin with resolution number 178-36LS as substituted on the floor. Madam Clerk. Resolution number 178-36LS as substituted on the floor. Introduced by Therese M. Terlahi, Tina Rose Munya Barnes, Sabina Flores Perez, Jose Pito Terlahi, Clinton E. Rigel, Talina Cruz Nelson, Amanda L. Shelton, Joe S. St. Augustine, Joanne Brown, Tello T. Tidegui, Mary Camacho Torres, V. Anthony Ada, Frank Blas Jr., Christopher M. Duenas, James C. Moylan. Relative to expressing the support of Imina Trentai Sais, Nelias Latod and Guahan, the 36th Guam Legislature, for the passage of S2798 and HR5338, introduced in the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives on September 22, 2021, which would amend the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act to include Guam as a downwinder of U.S. Pacific test sites, extend the fund claims period, and improve compensation and benefits. Roll call. Senator Ada. Sorry, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to make a motion that we excuse members not present today. On the motion to excuse from voting those members who are not present today, is there any objection to that motion? Seeing no objection, motion carries. Sorry, could you please uh, begin re redo the roll call? Roll call, please. Senator Ada. Senator Ada, aye. Senator Blas. Senator Blas excused. Senator Brown. Senator Brown, aye. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas, aye. Senator Moylan. Senator Moylan, aye. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes excused. Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson, aye. Senator Perez. Senator Perez, aye. Senator Rogel. Senator Rogel, aye. Senator St. Augustine. Senator St. Augustine, aye. Senator Shelton. Senator Shelton, aye. Senator Tidegui. Senator Tidegui, aye. Senator Terlahi. Senator Terlahi, excuse. Speaker Terlahi. Speaker Terlahi, aye. Senator Torres. Senator Torres, aye. Resolution number 178-36LS received 12 ayes and three excused. Resolution number 178-36LS is duly adopted by the body. We are now on resolution number 199-36LS. Clerks, please read the title without engrossment. Resolution number 199-36LS as substituted on the floor. Introduced by Therese M. Terlahi, Sabina Flores Perez, Jose Pito Terlahi, Tina Rose Munya Barnes, Clinton E. Rigel, Talina Cruz Nelson, Amanda L. Shelton, Joe S. St. Augustine, Joanne M. Brown, Tello T. Tidegui, Mary Camacho Torres, V. Anthony Ada, Frank F. Blas Jr., Christopher M. Duenas, James C. Moylan, Relative to expressing the support of Imina Trentai Saiz Nalias Latur and Guahan, the 36th Guam Legislature, for HR 3967 and S3003, because they recognize the Guam's Agent Orange exposure and advocating for amendments to HR 3967 and S3003 
that reflect the correct dates of Agent Orange use in Guam and veterans' exposure to toxins related to the U.S. military's open-air burn pit activity in Guam. Oh, shit. Roll call. Senator Ada. Senator Ada, aye. Senator Blas. Senator Blas, excuse. Senator Brown. Senator Brown, aye. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas, aye. Senator Moylan. Senator Moylan, aye. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes, excused. Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson, aye. Senator Perez. Senator Perez, aye. Senator Rajel. Senator Rajel, aye. Senator St. Augustine. Senator St. Augustine, aye. Senator Shelton. Senator Shelton, aye. Senator Tidegui. Senator Tidegui, aye. Senator Terlahi. Senator Terlahi, excused. Speaker Terlahi. Speaker Terlahi, aye. Senator Torres. Senator Torres, aye. Resolution number 199-36LS received 12 ayes and three excused. Resolution number 199-36LS is duly adopted by the body. We're now on resolution number 200-36LS. Clerks, please read the title without engrossment. Resolution number 200-36LS as substituted on the floor. Introduced by Therese M. Terlahi, Sabina Flores Perez, Jose Pito Terlahi, Tina Rose Munoz Barnes, Clinton E. Rigel, Talina Cruz Nelson, Amanda L. Shelton, Joe S. St. Augustine, Joanne M. Brown, Tello T. Tidegui, Mary Camacho Torres, V. Anthony Ada, Frank F. Blas Jr., Christopher M. Duenas, James C. Moylan. Relative to expressing the support of Imina Trentai Sai Snalihas Latur in Guahan for the passage of H.R. 3368, the Lonnie Kilpatrick Central Pacific Herbicide Relief Act, introduced by the Honorable Michael St. Nicholas in the United States House of Representatives on May 20, 2021, because it seeks to correct injustice, clarify the eligibility of affected veterans, and expedite the processing of veteran claims of health conditions caused by Agent Orange exposure in Guam, and advocating for an amendment to H.R. 3368 that reflects the correct dates of Agent Orange use in Guam. Roll call. Senator Ada. Senator Ada, aye. Senator Blas. Senator Blas, excused. Senator Brown. Senator Brown, aye. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas, aye. Senator Moylan. Senator Moylan, aye. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes, excused. Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson, aye. Senator Perez. Senator Perez, aye. Senator Rajel. Senator Rajel, aye. Senator St. Augustine. Senator St. Augustine, aye. Senator Shelton. Senator Shelton, aye. Senator Tidegui. Senator Tidegui, aye. Senator Terlahi. Senator Terlahi, excuse. Speaker Terlahi. Speaker Terlahi, aye. Senator Torres. Senator Torres, aye. Resolution number 200-36LS received 12 ayes and three excused. Resolution number 200-36LS is duly adopted by the body. We are now on resolution number 210-36COR. Clerks, please read the title without engrossment. Resolution number 210-36COR, introduced by Sabina Flores Perez, Therese M. Terlahi, Tello T. Tidegui, Joanne Brown. Relative to reaffirming Guam's right to safeguard cultural resources and to protect ocean ecosystems from environmental harm and exploitive industry interest through a moratorium on seabed mining to ensure the health of Guam's people. Roll call. Senator Ada. Senator Ada, aye. Senator Blas. Senator Blas, excused. Senator Brown. 
Senator Brown, aye. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas, aye. Senator Moylan. Senator Moylan, aye. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes, excuse. Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson, aye. Senator Perez. Senator Perez, aye. Senator Rajel. Senator Rajel, aye. Senator St. Augustine. Senator St. Augustine, aye. Senator Shelton. Senator Shelton, aye. Senator Tidegui. Senator Tidegui, aye. Senator Terlahi. Senator Terlahi, excuse. Speaker Terlahi. Speaker Terlahi, aye. Senator Torres. Senator Torres, aye. Resolution number 210-36-COR received 12 ayes and 3 excused. Resolution number 210-36-COR is duly adopted by the body. We're now on resolution number 203-36-LS. Clerks, please read the title without engrossment. Resolution number 203-36-LS, as amended by the author, introduced by Tina Rose Munya Barnes, Mary Camacho Torres, Talina Cruz Nelson, Therese M. Terlahi, Amanda L. Shelton, Joe S. St. Augustine, Jose Pito Terlahi, James C. Moylan, V. Anthony Ada. Relative to expressing the support of Imena Trentai Saiz Nalihas Latur in Guahan, the 36th Guam Legislature, for the passage of the Build Back Better Framework, which would provide needed investments in the community of Guam, including parity for U.S. citizens residing in the territories through supplemental security income inclusion and expansion of Medicaid. Roll call. Senator Ada. Senator Ada, aye. Senator Blas. Senator Blas, excuse. Senator Brown. Senator Brown, aye. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas, aye. Senator Moylan. Senator Moylan, aye. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes, excuse. Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson, aye. Senator Perez. Senator Perez, aye. Senator Rajel. Senator Rajel, aye. Senator St. Augustine. Senator St. Augustine, aye. Senator Shelton. Senator Shelton, aye. Senator Tidegui. Senator Tidegui, aye. Senator Terlahi. Senator Terlahi, excuse. Speaker Terlahi. Okay. Speaker Terlahi, aye. Senator Torres. Senator Torres, aye. Resolution number 203-36-LS received 12 ayes and 3 excused. Resolution number 203-36-LS is duly adopted by the body. We are now on resolution number 153-36-LS. Clerks, please read the title without engrossment. Resolution number 153-36-LS, introduced by Talina Cruz Nelson, Sabina F. Perez, Tina Rose Munya Barnes, James C. Moylan, V. Anthony Ada, Therese M. Terlahi, Mary Camacho Torres, Amanda L. Shelton, Jose Pito Terlahi. Relative to expressing the utmost support of Imina Trentai Saiz Nalihas Latura in Guahan and advocating for the passage of H.R. 928, American Family Act of 2021, introduced by Delegate Rosa DeLauro, Connecticut Representative, which seeks to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to make the child tax credit fully refundable, establish an increased child tax credit for young children and for other purposes. Roll call. Senator Ada. Senator Ada, aye. Senator Blas. Senator Blas, excuse. Senator Brown. Senator Brown, aye. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas, aye. Senator Moylan. Senator Moylan, aye. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes. 
Vice Speaker Munya Barnes excuse. Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson, aye. Senator Perez. Senator Perez, aye. Senator Rajel. Senator Rajel, aye. Senator San Augustine. Senator San Augustine, aye. Senator Shelton. Senator Shelton, aye. Senator Tidegui. Senator Tidegui, aye. Senator Terlahi. Senator Terlahi, excuse. Speaker Terlahi. Speaker Terlahi, aye. Senator Torres. Senator Torres, aye. Resolution number 153-36LS received 12 ayes and three excused. Resolution number 153-36LS is duly adopted by the body. We've exhausted the resolutions on third reading. Majority Leader, Senator Nelson, you are recognized. You just want to see Madam Speaker, I'd like to make the motion that we recess till 9 a.m. tomorrow. On that motion, are there any objections? Seeing no objection, motion carries. We are recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs>